It's interesting because I was hoping that uh, detention related issues, something that was very prominent during the, uh, the Bush 43 administration, uh, just sort of went away. Uh, in part because President Obama, with exception of enhanced interrogations, has basically embraced all of our aspects of the laws of war architecture, and that, of course, uh, prevented the usual suspects who engage in a term that Frank correctly used, lawfare, waged lawfare against the Bush administration, have sort of receded, and extreme left still, still there. Um, so I was hoping I would not have to chat about it anymore, but uh, we, we went for a fairly tough patch in the last several weeks. And I'm sorry to say, you know, apropos of, of, of bad developments in the conservative community, we have uh, folks who've unfortunately come out in the wrong way of this issue to explain. Um, there's something called NDAA, well, Capitol Hill folks understand authorization process better than I do, but the idea was that um, sort of a legal basis for uh, the exercise of war powers of course, can be traced to Article Two in the President's authority as Commander in Chief, but it's always great when two political branches speak in unison. So, as all of you know, we had something called authorization to use military force that was enacted by Congress within several days of, of 9 11. And that was the basis for, um, as far as the Article Three courts are concerned, for um, you know, recognizing the legitimacy of military detention. And so, you know, while meaning folks uh, decided, NDA, by the way, does not, uh, excuse me, AUMF does not specifically refer to detention, it really refers to uh, the President's ability to, uh, to wage war against those like Al-Qaeda and affiliated entities that begin to wage war against us. Detention of enemy combatants is an integral part of that. But it didn't specifically mention it, so the last year's NDA was the first successful effort to actually spell out few basic propositions about uh, detention authority, and it passed with some difficulty in the House, but it passed, and the President uh, said some unkind things in the, in the signing statement, but went along with it. So it got tougher this year, um, and frankly, the reason it got tougher this year is because a, a fairly sizable chunk of the Tea Party Caucus, for I have always great affection, as some of you may know, I when I don't do this stuff, I uh, was involved for almost two years in, the, uh, in leading the challenge to Obamacare on behalf of the 26 states. So I care very much about state sovereignty, and I, mean, I also care about the federal government's sovereignty, and waging a war is not constitutionally an area that the states have much, much authority. And I understand that uh, a lot of our Tea Party friends have been concerned, in my opinion, unreasonably so. Um, I'm not going to defend President Obama. Uh, the notion that in the second term Obama, Obama might resort to large-scale detentions of Tea Party patriots, a la detention of Japanese Americans issue in Korematsu case is, is not very plausible. But nevertheless, it, um, it drove their efforts, and they played in, in a couple of arenas. One, of course, was the, uh, and that Frank alluded to it, what happened last night, there was an effort led by a uh, bipartisan effort, a uh, so-called Smith-Mash Amendment that would have essentially barred military detention, an amendment to the NDA's language in 2013 NDA that essentially tracks the slight changes to 2012. And I was delighted to hear that it was defeated this, uh, just defeated a uh, fairly substantial margin in large part because a number of Democrats have, have joined. Unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, I, I saw the tally this morning, but I'm ready to be corrected. I think I have a 17 or 19 Republicans um, voted, uh, voted for it, which you asked me is 17 or 19 Republicans are, are too many. Uh, and one of the reasons, uh, I'll get to the state efforts in a second, but just to give you a full picture. One of the reasons I was very nervous yesterday is because we had a, probably the worst example of judicial activism, and I say, you know, not to exaggerate, we've had many judicial activism examples, but we had a case styled Hedges, which for the lead plaintiff, uh, Christopher Hedges, former New York Times reporter, brought in the uh, district court, federal district court in New York, uh, where the case has been called submitted for over 10 months. The judges happened to rule yesterday. Um, actually, 
the day before yesterday to be precise, declaring the uh, Section 1021 of NDA, which deals with military detention, to be unconstitutional as a violation of both First Amendment and due process. Um, a polling decision for a variety of reasons, most of which don't have anything to do with the merits because these people have no standing to challenge it. None of them are detained. Their fear of, they fear being detained in the future. Um, and, uh, but uh, it's going to be overturned by the Second Circuit without any difficulty, but it was cer certainly something that the proponents of Smith and Mash were, were citing. Now, that's sort of a, what's happening at the national level. Unfortunately, what's happening at the state level is, is also troubling because consistent uh, with the attacks by, uh, I don't want to say old Tea Party members are doing, but a fairly large chunk of a Tea Party, uh, in addition to try to change the law at the federal level, um, pushed the states to, uh, to enact statutes. And the lead one is Virginia, which actually did pass, called HB 1160. That would bar, I mean, again, a couple of paragraphs of badly drafted statutory language, but the basic idea is to uh, prevent the use of state resources, including law enforcement uh, and uh, Virginia National Guard, from assisting and aiding the federal government in any military detention of U.S. citizens. And in addition to Virginia, there's at least two dozen states, most of which are red states, unfortunately, who are in various stages of moving forward in the same way. I always should salute uh, Heritage in general and uh, my good friend Kelly Stimson in particular for uh, taking the leadership in that because uh, there have been two letters, one uh, that went to Governor McDonnell that uh, Colleen initiated and was signed by a number of folks, including former Attorney General Meese uh, and Mukasey, Secretary Chertoff, yours truly, and a few other, uh, few other folks from the Reagan and Bush uh, days uh, um, unsuccessful in, uh, in not convincing Governor McDonald, but it certainly helped shape the debate a little bit. And a similar letter went to, uh, to Congress in the context of debate about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the new NDEA. Now, why is it all troubling? Uh, I mean, a lot of folks point out that, you know, you can have a, a rid ridiculous situations where if you're a poor Virginia state trooper and you stop, uh, you know, somebody like Olaf Lockheed and you happen to know a person who's a U.S. citizen, you happen to know he's a member of Al-Qaeda, broken no state law, and uh, you happen to believe that he would be subject to military detention, um, technically speaking, you should let him go. But, you know, and, you know, more plausible scenario is the, uh, your uh, federalized Virginia guardsman who's uh, working in the Intelligence Fusion and Integration Center. And you think that you're processing raw data, and you think again, here's somebody, I'll block you, who is, of course, is dead as an example, uh, because he was a U.S. citizen. Uh, you, you believe that information you're processing would not lead to a drone strike on such person, but maybe a snatch team. Not very likely, since this administration certainly is not interested in taking anybody prisoner, but let's say the next one hopefully would take a different view. Um, you are not supposed to do that. Um, but the practical problems to me are less important than the symbolic problem. That's probably the most important thing I want to emphasize for you. Look, symbolism matters a great deal in these issues where democracy, where legitimacy and public acceptance is vital, particularly in the issues of war and peace that are kind of jarring to modern sensibilities in the 21st century, especially it's a long war. Democracies are notorious for losing patience. And in addition to that, the left spent eight long years attacking the laws of war architecture for the entire depth, not just detention and interrogation, but use of drones, um, ability to engage in use of force outside of, quote, active battlefield, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and all sorts of, you know, uh, an ability to use force preemptively, anticipatorily, and, you know, it, it, was, it, it, it was damaging. I mean, the administration held firm on, on most issues, no bad legislation passed, lots of hearings, but it did 
in that symbolic sphere, legitim legitimating sphere, it did some damage. And probably the only good thing from my perspective about the Obama administration is, as I said earlier, they retained except for the enhanced interrogation that they took off the table, any kind of interrogation. They retain everything else. And I was rejoicing a little bit because it provided at least put back some of that bipartisan patina. So the fact that our friends uh, in the Republican ranks are, are busy uh, uh, pushing against the NDAA type language and are pushing the states to, uh, to pass statutes similar to Virginia. By the way, passed in Virginia. I mean, I, I know everybody's very busy in organizations like the ones represented at the stable, including you know, Frank Center and, and Reserve Officers Association Heritage are busy playing at the national level. But I find it appalling that something like this passed in Virginia without anybody knowing in the state legislature what's going on by enormous margins, <clears throat> which, by the way, frankly, gave cover to the governor because he couldn't have vetoed it without the veto being overridden, or at least that's what, that's what we heard uh, uh, from his, uh, uh, from his uh, uh, people. Now, had he got down to the floor and made an impassionate <laughs> Plea, I like to think that he might have been successful. It, so it, it's not a good thing. It's not the end of the world, but it's it's it, it's an exercise in lawfare, and we have some very very unhelpful allies now. Um, you know, I could tell you why it's not only troubling from that perspective, why Virginia legislation is also legally very bad. Because for one thing, Virginia and other states have gotten billions of dollars since 9-11 from the federal government to beef up their intelligence and law enforcement entities. And one of the conditions the Department of Homeland Security imposes in receipt of federal funds is you know, fulsome cooperation on, uh, on Homeland Security matters. And if you're not going to have your people you know, transfer your out of like your, you know, not Osama bin Laden because he happens to be a US citizen, that's not fulsome cooperation, but there's also a constitutional problem, and just like the federal government should not interfere with legitimate exercise of state police power, which was the case with Obamacare and a few other things, the state should not try to pass laws that would impede the ability of a federalized um, state guardsmen who are really part of a chain of command to perform their duties and sort of put them in a position where they uh, caught between and betwixt to com a completing set of obligations. But as I said, to me, the real issue is, is, is symbolism and what's going to happen beyond this administration. 